the rivals, the Exeter Blue Hawks, and the Winnicott Warriors go at it again. We're talking all about it on this edition of the Seaco Sports Forum. Busy weekend. All the rival teams going at it. And in particular, right here in the Seacoast, the Exeter Blue Hawks and the Winnicunit Warriors. And to talk about all the different sports and all the different action that went on this past week, we have as our special guest today, Sam Bruno and Roger Brown from the Union Leader and the New Hampshire Football Report.com. Before we get into the overall picture of what went down, let's talk about the football contest. And and Roger, you were there. How does a team, the Blue Hawks, that were averaging 30 points a game, basically come up with only three or a three nothing shutout? Well, I think it was two things, Sherm, from what I saw. It was mostly Winnicott's defense, which was particularly strong in the interior where Exeter likes to run the ball between the tackles. So that was the biggest part of it. They were they were very good defensively. Um, but it was like a November night weather-wise in terms of the wind and whatnot. So, you know, it made, it made what little passing there was almost impossible to do. Um, so it was a combination of good winter kind of defense, uh, you know, some, some bad weather or tough weather to play in. And I'm guessing the Exeter coaches would tell you, you know, not every blocking assignment was executed as it should have been. So, um, you know, not, not a total surprise when it kind of, it's been playing good defense, their struggles have been on yeah. offense, which they had again. Right. And, um, their biggest problem in that game was turnovers. I thought, you know, cause they moved it. Okay. Boy. Um, so th- these are, these things happen when you get these rivalry games. Rivalry sure. week <laughs> game. Yes. So <laughs> again, it was, uh, a, a, a big game for both teams, obviously, but, when it kind of had to prove itself, you, like you just said, the defense proved itself, but what the offense just didn't, didn't have it going at all. Right. Well, like I said, turnovers, you know, that I think they turned it over four times. Um, you know, I found it interesting that coach ball uh, elected to kick both halves uh, instead of receiving in the second half. Mm-hmm. And you know, when it kind of wasn't like deep in Exeter territory, but they were moving and, uh, you know, there was an inter- uh, Evan Pafford had an interception on the first drive of the second half to, to pretty much, uh, you know, make that strategy sound and, and look good. Um, but even at the end of the game, I think, you know, when it kind of final play was a fumble and I was watching the ball just go forward, it looked like it was going to go into the end zone and could have been anybody's ball. Uh, but it ended up, you know, coming to a stop at the two yard line where Exeter recovered. But I think that was one of three fumbles that would have kind of lost during the game. So, you know, it wasn't like they were moving up and down the field by any stretch, but they didn't look anemic. I didn't think, you know, they were in the shotgun instead of under center, like they have been in most years. Uh, When they did get under center, they were running their veer stuff, you know, pretty well. I mean, it was a defensive battle on both sides. But the turnovers just uh, took away any chance when it kind of had to score enough points to win. And Sam, what did what was your takeaway from what you saw? Well, in the I, game? I, I think I think the key to the game was the four winner kind of turnovers. Uh, you take those turnovers away, and the Warriors uh, might have pulled this one out uh, because of their defense, uh, because of what they were able to do for the Exeter offense. Um, they decided to just play it very conservative, uh, stay between the tackles. Very rarely did they uh, go to the outside with a a quarterback bootleg or something like that, uh, which worked. Uh, I kept waiting for some sort of misdirection on the Exeter side, uh, but it wasn't there. Uh, They played a very conservative game. They didn't turn the ball over, which was great. And uh, I think that was the difference in the contest. Winnicunnan, hats off to the Warriors. Uh, They did not look like a team that hadn't won a game this season. Uh, every time Exeter got to the second level after the initial run, 
those linebackers for when it kind of shut them right down. They were right on the ball. So uh, uh, the Blue Hawks escape, and uh, now they get to uh, they they get to go to uh, Timberlane, uh, which is not going to be an easy game. Not going to be an easy game. Yeah, I'm just going to say that that is going to be a test. I mean, Timberlane is out to prove that they deserve to be in Division One, and uh, they were the champions of Division Two last year. Roger, what what's uh, your feeling about that upcoming contest? I think their next two games, Exeter's next two games, are going to be very, very tough. Uh, you know, Timberlane took BG right to the wire, and BG may be the best team out there. Uh, you know, it's still up in the air. Some people like Londonderry, some people like Exeter, some people think BG's the team, but they're certainly in the discussion. So I think Timberlane's already proved themselves. I, I don't think there's any question they're they're up there with the best teams in Division One. And then I believe Exeter is going to play Bedford, which since uh, since it's kind of a rough first half in their opening game has just been outstanding, uh, particularly on defense. So, you know, the next two weeks uh, pretty much going to tell us what, you know, where Exeter is going to fit in the postseason. Um, you know, we got kind of a strange postseason this year, but they need to win their conference to get a bye, you know, mm-hmm. that first week bye. So, um, you know, this is an important stretch, you know, that you figured it was going to kick off with a rivalry game, which would be tough. And it was, and now they have perhaps the two toughest opponents uh, on their schedule. So um, I expect Blue- both of these games to be really, really uh, close. And, um, you know, if the team doesn't play well, they're not going to win. Blue Hawks mm-hmm. do have an advantage that they're going to have three of their last four at home. So that's going to be a plus for them. Uh, my head scratcher right now is, uh, Roger, what's with the Spalding Red Raiders? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, good to see, right? 4-0 start. Uh, haven't played the toughest of opponents, you know, but they did beat a, a 3-0 and Dover team last week. So I think that probably convinced a few people that weren't on the bandwagon to jump on, so to speak. And, uh, you know, that's a team that struggled, proud program, um, didn't win a game last year. So in a lot of ways, I'm happy for them. A lot of people were thinking they should have been the team to go to Division Two, which clearly, you know, that turned out not to be the case. Um, yeah, they look like they're a handful. You know, they got some big backs and, and it wasn't it's not just one or two guys. They got three or four guys, uh, you know, rushing for hundred yards. It seems like on a weekly basis. So um, makes that end of the year game, certainly a lot more interesting, intriguing. Any other surprises in uh, division one or any, any of the divisions this, uh, this past weekend that you heard about or saw? Nothing really sure. I think the Spalding game was the one that got my attention. You know, they were up 30 to three on Dover, uh, you know, and I, I, I thought Dover would win the game. I certainly didn't expect it to be uh, lopsided in Spalding's favor. So that's the one that probably stood out, you know, um, just going through in my mind real quick. I don't think there was any other, you know, huge surprises. Mil- Milford struggled against Bo in Division Two. Milford was the runner up last year. They're struggling. So that was a little bit of a surprise. But I think that uh, that Spalding win was the one that tops it for me. Raj, I was going to ask you, you had mentioned Bishop Girton earlier. Um, uh, tell me a little bit. I, I don't know a lot about this Girton team. Is it is it dominant defense? Is it great offense? What is it? Well, they're very, very big up front, particularly their defensive line. And I mean, right across the board, big. Uh, they've got an experienced quarterback uh, who's a great athlete, basketball player. And, you know, an experienced running back in Charlie Bellavan. So these are all guys that were on their playoff team last year. Um, they added a few pieces. I heard they ha- – I haven't seen them uh, in the regular season, but they, they added, I guess, a wide receiver who's very good. Um, <clears throat> so it looks like it's pretty much a complete team. Um, you know, tough physical. They've got John Trishiani, who had been coaching at St. A's as uh, their line coach this year. They added him. So I'm sure that helped out. Um, so just going to be, you know, I, I would say they got a little bit of everything from what I know. They can throw it, run it, play defense, um, got size, strength. You know, they're going to be formidable for anybody. 
And they got the Green Bay Packer outfits. <laughs> they do. Exeter winner kind of uh, always a lot of fun. And uh, four out of five victories for the Blue Hawks. Uh, Sam, you want to run us down on what we yeah, saw? Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to, I, I am going to be kind of a downer here and start with the only loss, which was okay. the field hockey team. Okay. The, the, the girl, the girls field hockey team lost a tough one in overtime. Uh, the tying goal came in the, like the last 15 seconds and then they dropped uh, the game to the Warriors in overtime, but it's certainly not an upset. I mean, Winnicott is an eight and one field hockey team and Exeter is eight and one right now. And uh, those teams will probably meet somewhere down the road again. Uh, so uh, uh, Deb Grotz team is uh, certainly a team to, to, uh, to be reckoned with during the season. Wyndham is always going to be a tough team and they're going to be the leaders right now in the clubhouse to see if they can, uh, if they can do it. Uh, but uh, at eight and one, uh, you know, we're, we're approaching the midway point of the seasons now or just past halfway. So uh, it's starting to look ahead for playoff positioning in those types of situations. But again, as you said, sure, both the boys and girls soccer teams beat the Warriors and the volleyball team beat the Warriors. So it was a pretty good uh, couple of days. Good weekend. Good weekend. Um I was going to say, as far as the uh, overall picture coming up for the other teams, any, again, you mentioned Wyndham being a, a dominant team in the field hockey. What about some of the other uh, upcoming thing, action for soccer? Well, a boys soccer Exeter uh, is going into this week's play at uh, six and two. And uh, that puts them in around fourth or fifth place in division one. Uh, Again, everybody, there are no undefeated teams in boys division one soccer right now. So uh, people are knocking off each other right now. So Dan Curran squad, a winning record as we get to the midway point and uh, should be pretty good down the stretch uh, for Megan Young. Eight. No, I mean, don't we always say that? It yeah. seems like we always do. Uh, okay. Portsmouth Clippers, though, watch out for Portsmouth. They lead Division One right now with a 9-0 and record. So uh, the second half of the season, uh, Exeter will certainly be up there. Uh, Unified Soccer, uh, Exeter has only played one game. They've got a game coming up this week. Uh, they're 1-0 and right now. And uh, Sherm, you follow the golf team. Yeah, what's I was going to bring the, what's up. With the, what's with the Exeter golf team? 23-0. Yeah. They haven't lost a match this season. Yeah. Now, Coach Bailey said that uh, he, was, he was he was stacked. This team is stacked, and uh, they are this season. We'll have to get him back on the show and maybe some of the, the players this year because they just uh, are the dominant team. Well, let's move on to the college ranks and a, and a game we uh, – well, I listened to it. I don't know if you guys got <laughs> to watch it, but the fact is the, the Wildcats had a big game uh against one of their old rivals Towson and a uh, big game for Dylan Lobby. Uh, Roger, you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, it was it was a game that uh you know, special teams certainly sparked them. They uh, they opened the game with an onside kick that they recovered that led to a field goal, one of three field goals. And if you've been a UNH football fan over the years, you know field goals haven't come easy for that program, so uh, Nick Mazzi, a freshman, was three for three in that area. And then Lobby, uh, I think it was he tied a school record with a 92-yard punt return for a TD yep. to make it 10 nothing. So, you know, special teams got him out of the gate strong. And, uh, you know, one of their better all-around performances against Towson and uh, put him at 3-0 and in the CAA going into a, you know, a tough FBS game against Western Michigan. But I don't think it's one of those games that, you just mail it in and accept your 42 to six loss. I think, I think they can give Western Michigan some trouble. They've, you know, that's a team that's struggling at uh, quarterback position and uh, you know, who knows if they can stick with them and uh, keep it close late, maybe pull out a win like they did in the, you know, those Ricky Santos days when he was playing against these FBS teams. Uh, another strong game from Joey Corcoran, who's uh, played his prep school football in Concord at St. Paul's school seems to be emerging as maybe their top wide receiver. Um, and, you know, Dylan Ruiz opposite Josiah Silver, I think he had three sacks in the game. So, wow. you know, maybe they're making teams pay for focusing on Josiah after his, you know, breakout freshman year, strong freshman year. Hmm. Um, a lot of positives for UNH in that game, you know, both sides of the ball. And as I mentioned, special teams. So 
Mm, you know, you coming mean. off a loss, that's pretty much what you want to see. You know, a rebound effort like that, where they're good in all three phases, and and uh, you know, have some confidence going into what will probably be their toughest game of the year. Yeah, and that uh, I was going to say after Western Michigan, we get homecoming game. And Sam, you want to just talk about that a little bit? Stony Brook. Yeah. Stony Brook's coming to town. That's going to be a 3.30 game on uh, Saturday the 8th. Uh, so uh, that's always a big crowd and uh, exciting. And, uh, you know, I think I, I agree with Roger. I think Western M Michigan uh, is not going to be a, a definite win. You know, definitely put that into the column. I think uh, UNH's defense can uh, can keep it close. Uh, you know, I think I think like any game like that, you've got to get through the initial five or 10 minutes uh, and just not get blown off right off the bat, you know, mm -hmm. and get behind right away. If they can, if they can play a solid first quarter, I think they could probably hang with them. Um, Got to go to the Patriots. Oh. What was your take on what you saw? We'll start with you, Sam, on this time. I'll tell you, uh, the glory days are over. Uh, you know, it's, it's just the Patriots defense is just a mess right now and uh you know they hung in there offensively and had a couple of leads in that ball game yesterday but uh lamar jackson may be back to his mvp form uh what a great game uh he had uh but you can't you can't give up 37 points and win in the nfl it just it just can't happen and you know i really thought the patriots in front of their home crowd for the first time um would have been given a better defensive effort in that ball game, but it just didn't happen. First off, you know, any, any feelings you had about that game with the Patriots, but also what your take is on, on what's happening in the NFL. There's no real dominant dogs. Everybody's kind of feeling their way out bills right now, uh, Tampa Bay, green Bay, uh, who else with Kansas city, nobody's dominating right now. So what, what's your take? Well, I like it that way, you know, personally, I mean, I, I the Patriots, they're, they're, in terms of them, they're pretty much giving me what or giving us what I thought they would. I, you know, I didn't have high hopes for them. So it's back to the days where any game you can win is, you know, enjoyable for those of us old enough to remember those days. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, you just got to readjust your expectations. Um, with Mac, you know, those high, if it is a high ankle sprain, which, like you said, Sherman, is what's been reported, at least as of right now. You know, those high ankle sprints can go on for a long time. Mm. You know, just mm. ask the guys at UNH. That's that's not like a regular sprain where you give it three or four days and you come back. You know, that can go on. I've seen that keep people out for, you know, half a season or more. Not saying it will with him, but you just never know. It's, it's one of those things that, you know, could be worse than it sounds. Um, I like the fact that there's no dominant teams. You know, I think it makes it more interesting. Uh, you know, like I watched the Jaguars Chargers game and, uh, you know, just got throttled Chargers, you know, which a lot of people thought that was a Super Bowl team. And I don't care if uh, the quarterback was hurt or not. They, they were not winning that game. Um, so it's good. You know, you got more games that, uh, you know, could go either way. That's more entertaining. And draft teams love it too. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, if you're a sharp guy, you can make some money out of it, I guess. Uh, but when the playoffs get here, you know, I, you know, I like it. I don't like it when there's two or three teams that are, you know, eventually going to get there where I like, I like every game to be up in the air, toss up. And hopefully that's what we have. The, the infamous word parody. Well, speaking of our uh, sharpshooter, uh, Sam, what's your take on the NFL? At this well, point? the darling of the NFL is Tua Tug of Viola. Viola. That's like saying rivalry. Okay. It's a, rivalry. Yes. It's, he, he, Tua, <laughs> Tua, Tua is the darling of the NFL right now uh, with those dolphins and the way that they are playing right now. Uh, you know, don't discount the New York giants at two and oh, right now. Okay. The giants are two and oh, and finally for the Patriots, um, We've been in that spot before, say we, uh, we've been at one and two early in the season and Bill and the staff have been able to turn it around. Can this staff do it? Again, I said before the football season started that the Joe Judge, Matt, Patricia, Bill Belichick triumvirate was a mistake. And I guess I'm still going to stay with that. Um, I think they needed some, some new blood in there uh, to shake things up a little and uh, uh I'm sorry to say that the first three games of that is coming true right now. Yeah, the Mac Jones uh, injury could play uh, havoc with uh, a lot of things. Okay, two words, Sherm. 
so. two words to remember bailey zappy we may we may be entering the bailey zappy era uh, brian hoyer's look look, be- look look what look what happened when bledsoe got hurt mm-hmm. 20, 20 years later i would much rather see zappy than hoyer this week i gotta right. tell you like that's yeah. the difference between me watching and not watching yeah, I right. agree. I mean, you, you're right. There could be lightning in a bottle. This is how Tom Brady got his big shot, right? And we don't want to see it happen that way. But uh, the big news story uh, of the week, which came out of the blue, a friend of mine texted me about it. And I was like, huh? I hadn't heard about it at that point. Uh, is this mess with the Celtics and their head coach, uh, Emi Aduka. And uh, I, I, first off, I'm just going to say, I, I like the way the Celtics and the Boston press are kind of handling this thing. I guess ESPN has been dishing out a lot more and, and, and some of the other uh, sports, you know, sources. Uh, what, a, what, what's your take on it? We'll start with Sam, Sam. Well, from, from a, from a purely basketball standpoint, uh, changing coaches a week before the season starts uh, is always going to be an emotional turmoil for the team. Now, on the other hand, basketball season goes for so long that there's some time here to get things in order. Um, should the Celtics have gone with a division two, division three coach assistant in Joe Missoula, or should they have gone and hired someone with more experience that might be on the sidelines somewhere uh, to come in and take over and be the interim coach for a year? Um, that surprised me a little bit that Stevens didn't come down from the general manager's office first, uh, but also that they didn't hire someone out of the situation. The other situation is the human resources side, okay? And this is more of the legality, more of the uh, issue of um, uh, him not following team policies in situations like this. Um, I think the Celtics are going to be called on something, which is if they knew about Udoka's indiscretions in the summer, supposedly then they hired a, private firm to do an investigation they got the investigation results and then they suspended him in most human resources cases what happens is if something like that comes to the attention of the management you immediately suspend the person and then do the investigation so i think udoka should have been suspended this summer Mm. while the investigation was going on. So I think that's where the Celtics made a little bit of a mistake and they're going to get called on that um, mm-hmm. from a lot of situations. So that's my take there. What about you, Roger, as far as this situation? What, how do you, what's your take on it? Well, I guess I don't understand why the other party hasn't been reprimanded. It was a Celtics employee, right? That's what I understand, yeah. yeah so I don't understand that part of it because... Uh, they would have broken company policy as well, right? Well, that's the thing. We they that they, they may have done that, but they, the the press is not focusing on that person. They're focusing strictly on the head coach. And I think you're you're right. That hasn't come out. So, uh, to my knowledge, I haven't heard anything about so that. It. So, yeah. so that part is strange, and it makes me wonder exactly what he did. Yeah, you know, yeah. If, if one person's being penalized and the other yeah. one is not course a year-long suspension makes me wonder what he did as well oh. since we've had things like players choking their coach and they haven't got suspended mm-hmm. for this long mm-hmm. and right. I, I assume he's going to be fired at the end of his suspension uh, they probably can't fire him now be, for legal reasons I'm guessing I don't know uh, I would think if they could have they would have probably um, so supposedly, well, supposedly he was going to resign uh, when this all came out. He, he was so upset at the way it was handled. He was going to resign. But then I'd probably his lawyer said to his agent, don't do that. Don't do that. Because Sam brought it up. It's got to go through a lot of processes before sure. it gets. Well, there's you know, probably money involved if he resigns as opposed to being fired right. and all that stuff. So, right. I mean, hey, Roger, I, I agree. Coaching is done in the NBA today, aside from a few guys anyways. So. You know, if the guys like you and play hard for you, I guess that's what matters. I agree with you, Roger, that uh, if the only policy that was violated was a consensual relationship between two employees, I agree with you that the punishment may not fit the crime. I'm guessing that there were other policies that must have been violated here 
for this yeah. to happen. So I haven't heard anything about the NBA getting into this thing at all. I think it's manage a management employee situation. Okay. So, with, so that, that, that there is no penalty at this point for the NBA to impose upon the Celtics and or the coach. I don't think that. I don't think I don't they think violated that. an NBA policy. It was just a no. Celtics policy, okay. right? Just Celtic. Right. Okay, all right. That's, that's the only thing I because there again, uh, if this thing goes to a court situation, it'll linger for a long time. I mean, go back to baseball with Alex Cora and the Houston Astros and the cheating scandal. I mean, he did the right thing. I mean, he, eh, I guess he admitted to, that they were cheating and he took yeah. his punishment. He took his year off the, the Celtic, I should check that the Red Sox management went down and, and talked it over with him to see if he, you know, was serious and, and, and sincere about it. Uh, and he was and say, OK, we forgive you. Let's come come back to the Red Sox and manage again. Uh, I don't know if this will happen with the Celtics. I really don't. Hopefully, you know, this kid that they do throw into the driver's seat is coach. I'm surprised, Sam, you're right. I thought Brad would come down from the GM post or whatever his operations post and take over just for the interim. But well, we'll see. Maybe it'll be gotta I don't be think a... the players like Brad Sherm. I think that's why he's yep. not there to begin with. Yeah, well, I agree. there's got to be a van. There's got to be a Van Gundy around somewhere, right? <laughs> yeah, got a mask some, somewhere. <laughs> some sort of Van Gundy, you know. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, I was going to say there's got to be somebody out there other than the usual retreads that they bring in, and and it was nice to see the coach this this first year coach have such an effect on a team, and and then now it's gone, and hopefully this new kid can kind of just you know rally out rally the troops around him and 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 get that same vibe but it's two minute drill time uh sam I'll, I'll let roger have a minute to get his thoughts together okay two minute drill time i've got two things here sure uh one uh two big thumbs up to the nfl they have just announced they have scrapped their all-star game which was a joke <laughs> you know again having an all-star football game where players play at 10% speed for the whole contest uh, is really just silly. It's just a way to get players to party for a weekend and get them to Hawaii or California or wherever they play the game. So they're going to go to an all-star, uh, not an all-star, but a, a competition-based, skills competition-based, like the NBA does on Saturday night and what the NHL does. Uh, they're going to have a flag football game. They're going to have it in Las Vegas. It's going to be a good time, and it's going to be the weekend before the Super Bowl. Uh, which is late this year. Super Bowl is on February 12th this year. But I applaud the NFL for scrapping that meaningless, stupid NFL All-Star game, uh, which made absolutely no sense. Everybody who gets picked, the starters decide they don't want to play because they don't want to get hurt, so they don't go. Uh, it was just stupid. Second thing happened on Saturday. Saturday afternoon, there's a great college football game going on between Clemson and Wake Forest. They're going back and forth and scoring and turnovers. And it eventually goes to overtime. ESPN, though, decided that every time Aaron Judge got up to bat to try oh, to see if yeah. we could get the record, they did a cut in mm -hmm. to show and went split screen with Aaron Judge. This caused a furor of fans up in arms against ESPN <laughs> How dare you take my football game off the full screen to show me Aaron Judge? So I'm thinking to myself and I'm saying, has baseball fallen that far right now that you can't take 90 seconds out of a football game to watch a guy going for a, a long time record? Uh, and ESPN has been crucified for this right now uh, for doing this. So uh, I guess it's just an idea of where baseball and football is right now, uh, as far as the fans are concerned. Um, you know, there could have been some other options. For example, they could have waited to see if Judge got the home run, plugged it in after a break, and then see, this is just what happened, and then show it. You don't right. have to go. You don't have to go live to it. Um, but uh, you know, it, it's going to be interesting this week where he's got uh, nine or ten games left to uh -huh. see if he can go. See if he can go for the record. And how the networks handle this. Uh, to show it to us. And I was happy that uh, they didn't give that coverage to it, but I was happy that Albert Pujols got his 700th and joined that elite group of Babe Ruth, Hank Aaron, and Barry Bonds. Sherm, uh, Roger, 
if we were at bat and got those fastballs, we would have been able to hit a home run. They grew. Los Angeles wanted to have that in their stadium. They just grooved the ball. It was unbelievable. So, and before we go to Roger, I just wanted to get your picks. Now we're heading. We got one more week of the regular season left. Which Dodgers, now, Dodgers. Oh, I know you, the Dodgers. <laughs> what about you, Sam? What are you, what's your projection? Well, well, I I think the American League. You know, your, your division winners are going to be the Yankees, Cleveland, and Houston. So you've got to think, you know, is Houston going to show up because they're the class of those three. Right. So Cleveland has become the darlings of the American League. Uh, the Indians uh, have been playing great baseball. Of the wild card teams, you've got Seattle, Toronto, and Tampa Bay um, out of those wild card teams. So I think the American League, if Houston decides not to show up, I think any of those other teams could win it. So I think, again, it's going to come down to the pitching. Who's got the best pitching staff? I, I, I think the Yankees are a mess. I think Toronto can't hit their way out of it. Cleveland's got a sneaky good rotation there that they could have a problem with, with McKenzie and Bieber. Um, Houston's got the class of the pitching. And Seattle has just gone into the tank for the last 10 days. So I don't know if they're going to be able to pull themselves out of it. Tampa Bay, never discount Tampa Bay. So I think Cleveland, Tampa Bay, and Houston, I can discount the other three teams. Not that I'm anti-Yankee. Over in the National League, yeah, Dodgers, 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 Dodgers. Uh, Atlanta and St. Louis and, and Philadelphia, yeah, who cares? The Mets. <laughs> you can, they, they, again, it, it's not going to happen. So let's just get the Dodgers there. But the American League opponent is up for grabs. All right. All right. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll hold you, hold you that. The one thing is, and I just, we'll, we are getting to you, Raj. The fantasy of course. thing. The fantasy baseball thing oh. this week, the last week of the regular season is a disaster for anybody who plays fantasy baseball. And the coach's team, by the way, is, is leading the pack in, in his particular league. And and the sad thing is most of his pitching staff, and he's got a good one, won't pitch this week because they're going to rest them up for the playoffs. And that's the sad thing, or they'll go out and pitch two innings and that's it. <laughs> So Roger, uh, do, do we do we have any day baseball playoff games? Have they announced the schedule yet? Close. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but I they like coming home. Yeah, from I know. School and turning on a game and then having yeah. two more at night. So, well, what's your two minute drill, sir? Okay, I got. I was thinking about. It. I got two things as well. Uh, the first one, locally, I was happy to see the Exeter win a kind of football game move back to Friday night. It was used to be a Friday forever. They played it on Saturdays for a while, for good reason, I'm told. But moving it to Friday night, I think it gives uh, – I don't know how many of these other rivalry games were played Saturday, but it gives that day where they have the spotlight on them, you know, whatever is being played that day. But it also, uh, you know, over at Winnicott, kind of, there was games going on in the afternoon, and those crowds just kind of moved over. It was cold, unfortunately, but – it's kind of like uh, part one of the double header. If you go to the soccer game, then meander on over to the football field. So I, I just think that's a good thing and it helps the rivalry. <clears throat> so hopefully there's no shenanigans and they can con continue to play on Fridays. Um, number two, since we're just changing everything in major league baseball these days, would anybody, I guess a question for Sam, maybe any problems with shortening the season from April till the end of August and then have the playoffs? None, none. I, mean, I think it's a great you gotta idea. you got to be a diehard. I think your point yeah. with Aaron Judge just shows people, once football starts, baseball takes a huge back seat. So right. let's end it earlier yeah. and uh, maybe start it when the weather's warm. You'd have to play fewer games, but that would just make it more meaningful, I think, each game. So, Yeah, I agree with you there. And, and another thing they could do, I know they will never play the classic double headers again ever in our lifetime, but they can do the split bill thing. So they have a one o'clock afternoon game, like you were saying, and then have an evening, you know, nightcap that the unions probably will vote that down because it just isn't yeah, right. That's the know. problem. They and, want and, yeah, more games and, means more money. And you can't play. I mean, go back to those thrilling days of yesteryear where these guys would go out and play two nine inning games back to back with a little lunch break or a break in between the same guys. Now it's like, 
uh, the managers have to come up with a super rotation because you can't put uh, Rafi Devers in, in two games in a row because oh man, he, you know his arms might fall off, or and then you got to rotate. You know, it's just it be it's too complicated. <laughs> it's they're they are ruining the sport with every move they do. Yeah, they complicate it. You're right. Well, sure, uh, Shrim, I was just going to say, Roger had asked about day games. Um, mm-hmm. I just looked at the M- MLB uh, postseason schedule. On Friday, the 7th of October, Saturday, the 8th of October, and Sunday, the 9th of October, there are going to be four wildcard games on each day. So they're going to have to play them at like 1 o'clock, 4 o'clock, hmm. 6 o'clock, 9 o'clock. So each day yeah, that's, is going. That's good. Yeah. I, I'm hoping for like a Tuesday 4 o'clock game is what I'm hoping for. Well, but then Kids when it gets – school. Yeah, you know, like we used to have back in the day, yeah. you know. Oh, sure. Everybody remembers yeah. the Yankees Red Sox playoff game, too, right? You know, those. oh, uh, you know, I remember, uh, you know, Mazeroski's home run for the Pittsburgh Pirates. When you get to Fox in the division series and that kind of situation, those are all going to be at night, uh, in that situation. And again, just a note if the World Series does go seven games, the final game's going to be on November 5th. Uh, my two-minute drill. I want to, uh, and Roger, this is a, a lady you probably should try to get some information on and get an interview with because uh, London, London, Derry, New Hampshire's uh, 25-year-old Noelle Lambert. Now, yeah. she's, Noel. she's okay. She's a special lady. I'd love to get her on the show. Um, she is a U.S. Paralympian. Uh, six years ago, she lost a leg in an accident, and uh, she turned that tragedy into a, a, a triumph by by getting into the Paralympics and doing super in the Tokyo Games. Uh, but now she's doing something totally, yeah, off off the charts as far as I'm concerned. And I'm wishing her all the best because I'm a big fan of the television show Survivor, and that's where she is. She's on the island with sixteen other people. And uh, we shall see how long she lasts. I hope right down to the very last uh, tribal council, we'll, we'll we'll have to keep tabs on Noel. And uh, I, it's it's what a what a what a gutsy kid. I mean, that, I saw the first show, and uh, nothing's going to stop her. She's she you know she and she doesn't oh woe is me. I'm I've got a, a you know handicap. No, not at all, not at all. She's not playing that game or that card at all. And uh, she is going to give those guys and gals on the island a challenge, and. Uh, We'll see if Jeff Probst can avoid snuffing her torch and she gets to the, the final council and, and wins, uh, I think it's a million bucks. So time will tell. And, and I'd love to have her on the show. I've always loved to, we've had a few people from New Hampshire on Survivor over the years. And I know some of them have moved on to elsewhere, but once in a while, it, it'd be fun just to have one of these people on and talk mm-hmm. about the, the inner workings. For a guy like me, we know there's a lot of cameras and a lot of moving parts to that show that we don't see and uh, they've tried to give us some insider looks over the past few seasons to keep it fresh but uh, good luck to noel lambert from londonderry and uh, we'll uh, like i say we'll be keeping tabs on her on the future shows here at the seaco sports forum and and before we sign off i just want to ask you uh, anything that we should keep tabs on in the union leader or on, or on new hampshire football report that uh, are coming up well, I don't know. Just you know, high school football fans were we're at the midseason point here. We're you know, so it won't be too long before the playoff picture starts to kind of take shape. So, you know, I'm sure we'll be writing about that. And uh, and again, I keep mentioning it, but it is a new new setup this year, so people aren't as familiar with it, and more teams will be in the playoffs. So, you know, something to look forward to and educate yourself on the playoff, uh, you know, possibilities. I guess in the next couple of weeks. You always have some insider stuff going on with the Wildcats and, and other teams here in the state. So, yeah, all the UNH stuff is free this week. Um, you know, they're three and zero start. We're just trying to get people more uh, more engaged with the program. So, um, you know, we'll see if they can keep it going here. In their non conference game. New Hampshire Football Report dot com, folks. Well, that I guess wraps it up, gentlemen. So, on behalf sure, of sure, sure, remember, re, re, remind everyone that if they're at any Exeter games and they want to take any video, thank you of games. Thank you, thank you. Please be sure to do that. Yeah, if you do go to any of our Exeter contest or any any contest in the Seaco, send us the uh, video. It can be telephone video, you know, the camera 
from the phone. That's fine. So send it to Seco Sports Forum at yahoo.com and our producer Bob will get it into the television version. And of course, the podcast version that people listen to available on all the uh, major platforms. Okay, well, thank you for reminding me about that, Sam. That's, that is a, a very important reminder. So on behalf of Sam Bruno and Roger Brown from the Union Leader and the New Hampshire Football Report.com, this is Sherm Chester inviting you to join us for the next edition of the Seco Sports Forum. You can listen to the Seco Sports Forum on your favorite podcast platform. And don't forget to watch the episodes of the Seco Sports Forum on our Seco Sports Forum YouTube page. And when you're there, hit the bell to subscribe and like us. And if you have any sports photos or game videos you'd like to send us or comments, Seco Sports Forum at yahoo.com. This is Sherm Chester inviting you to join us for the next edition of the Seco Sports Forum. Seco Sports Forum.